Welcome to Murfreesboro Storyteller. Today we are originating from Fire Station 7 of the Murfreesboro Fire and Rescue Department, located on Thompson Lane. And we have a special story to tell about our wonderful Fire and Rescue Department. Our guests today are Chief Mark Folks. Chief, welcome again. Thank you. Glad to be here. Driver uh, Josh Oliver and Captain Clay Walls, who is captain of the Murfreesboro Fire and Rescue Department. Recently, I believe, Chief, you dispatched a number of your firefighters to the eastern coast of the, of the country, South Carolina in particular. Tell us what the occasion was. Yeah, we had uh, some extensive flooding, especially in the Columbia area. That's what the initial team was sent over there for. Uh, we received a call uh, on that Saturday that all this was occurring and requesting assistance from departments that had rescue teams, in particular water rescue teams available. Um, we, had, we had that capability and upon conferring with uh, the city manager, Rob Lyons, about sending our crews over there to assist, um, we actually sent the crews over. They initially were stood up on Saturday and, and they left, actually got ready to leave the city and shortly after leaving, uh, they got called back because the area that they were going to house them, which was the South Carolina Fire Academy in Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, was flooded. And the academy itself really wasn't flooded, but there was no way into the academy uh, because of the floodwaters around it. So we were re kind of recalled. Early Sunday morning, about 6.15, I received another phone call asking for our, our crews to deploy. Um, I made contact with our, with our teams and we deployed around 8 o'clock that morning, headed toward Tima East in Knoxville uh, to go in convoy over to South Carolina. So others from Knoxville or other stations in East Tennessee? Yeah, there were, there were multiple crews. Some went over, went ahead and went over Saturday and they actually stayed in Knoxville on Saturday night at a National Guard armory. They slept on cots and that was about all they could, they could put up with those crews that they originally had go over from that area in East Tennessee, but they pulled several crews from, from the Middle Tennessee area. Is this a normal occurrence that departments cooperate with each other this way when they have tra well, local tragedies? This, this call was um, very, a very tragic event. I mean, mm -hmm. it was something on the level not quite of Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina, but very close with the amount of flooding that they had. Their resources were very overwhelmed very quickly. Uh, and we do have a Tennessee uh, mutual aid system set up through the Tennessee Fire Chiefs Association that allows for deployment such as this. And, and this particular request was an emergency management assistance compact request, which means we're going out of state uh, and they could be gone up to 10 days at a time. And they were gone for how long totally? Uh, we actually had the first crew over there for um, six days and then the second crew went over on Thursday and came back on Sunday. So mm -hmm. four days on the second crew. Well, we have uh, two of the firefighters that went on that trip, uh, our driver, uh, Josh Oliver and Captain Walls and we want to hear about your personal experiences over there. Uh, Josh, tell us about uh, the occasion. Did you actually take a truck over there from yes, the sir. department? Yes, sir. We had a, uh, well, the first team that deployed, they had a, uh, uh, one of our Tahoes that we use here at the department. Oh, okay. And one of our old rescue trucks. And uh, when we met up with them, we swapped vehicles. But uh, we left Sun Sunday. You left Thursday morning Thursday at morning, 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock in the morning made it to a team of East in Knoxville and they sent us from there to Columbia. And in Columbia, we met up with the first team that was mm -hmm. there, went over equipment, uh, they debriefed us on where we were gonna be going, what they had been doing, and so forth. And Captain Walls, were you in the first group or the second group? I was the team leader for the first group that went over. And we, um, we were notified as the chief of San on Saturday that we would potentially be going. And uh, we were called a couple hours later and told that it was a definite go, everything had been approved, and uh, we put our team together that day. I was told to get it myself and four others. This was the first team over. And um, those were Captains Gary Hutchinson, uh, drivers uh, Jeremy McCullough, firefighter Jeremy Spivey, and firefighter Mark Brewer. Okay. We were the first team. And as uh, we were got all our equipment, got ready to go that day, uh, because of the flooding that they had, they lost the uh, facilities for us to stay in South Carolina. Yeah. So we were actually held up and deployed the next morning at uh, about 7.30 we left Murfreesboro. Uh, pretty much all day travel to get there. I'm sure. So uh, we were actually activated, did our first missions Sunday morning. Okay. And um, at that point, the rivers, they actually in Columbia, they had crested uh, at their highest point probably midday Saturday. And that's where you, if you saw the pictures where they were the water is actually up in the roof lines and the cars and buildings and a lot of the actual swift water where they had to deploy 
And like the chief said, they were just really overwhelmed. They weren't expecting it to be anywhere near as bad as they had. So the second day, our, our first deployments when we went out, we, like we said, we carried our rescue and then a vehicle for us all to travel in and two boats. And we deployed both of our boats and uh, we were doing house to house searches just to make sure that, that uh, everyone was out of these houses that had, had been so heavily damaged and the floodwaters had got so high. And, and then we, were, we would mark them as they're being searched. And we had, a, you know, if what we found, if there were any hazards, any special hazards associated with it, and we were actually paint on the house what it, what it was. And we did, uh, we did a lot of that from boat because it was still flooded. Uh, we did, um, I think we rescued um, four or five the first day we removed that we found. From and, these houses? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, I know the first one we had uh, a mother and a son and five dogs that we oh, brought out. I was wondering about the pets. Right? Yes, sir. Well, we brought the pets. People won't leave without them. Yeah, you know, sure. I mean, that's, that's if they're coming, they're taking their dogs with them, or cats, or whatever they had. <laughs> Part of the family. So we brought them out um, and spent the majority of that day just um, going house to house and making sure that, that no one was in the homes. Uh, later that day, we were actually deployed to a, um, an earthen levee. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with Columbia, but it's actually a series of small lakes run all through Columbia, South Carolina. Did not realize that. And I think there's 14 of them. Mm -hmm. And those, the, they were earthen levees, and they became so saturated that they started failing. Uh -huh. And they, the first one up high failed, and after that, they would load. Oh, sorry about that. They'd load everyone underneath and just overpressure it, and they just continued to wash out. And, just like a domino and effect. Continued, and, that, and we had more flooding issues because of the, uh, the earth, or the dams giving way. And we were actually on the first dam when we called it in. We were standing on it when it gave way, so we were, we backed up and watched it. And called this it in. A, this and, was an earthen dam, you said. Yes, right? sir, just to let them know that we were probably going to have potential, you know, sure. potential problems down below it. So at that point, we went, we went down and got ahead of the water, you know, because it was continuing downstream. And, and um, we did about 15 uh, rescues at that point, just removing people that had elected initially to stay in their home. Mm -hmm. And once they realized what was happening, they wanted to leave, so we took those out. Uh, did that for the first couple of days, uh, just house to house searching, make sure that you know, everyone was out. Either no one was there, or if they wanted to come out, they they was able to come out. Uh, the the last three days we was there, we really did more damage assessment for, uh, you know, just making sure that uh, people had what they needed because they they didn't have water service. They had nothing. They had a boil order all over the the city of Columbia, so we were making sure they had water. And we you know we'd take water with us if they needed it. Um, that no one that was there, that they were left, that they wanted to come out, we would bring them out. If they elected to shelter in, st in place, that was fine. We'd leave them there. Mm -hmm. And um, that was primarily the last three or so days we were there. That's what we did. We did damage assessment. And that's when uh, Josh's team came down. And uh, like we said, we did our, our changeover. We, we, you know, we were there for six days, but for the first three of them, we probably averaged three hours of sleep a night. So, yeah. so we were really ready to come to, to come home and get some rest. And and these guys came down, and, and we left our equipment with them, and we came back to Murfreesboro. And this is flooding that was caused by the hurricane that actually never did hit land, but the flooding uh, re was a result. Yes, correct? sir. It's Hurricane Joaquin, and okay. it, it never made landfall, but it dumped. In the Columbia area, 14 to 17 inches, depending where you was at in the city. Oh, and towards the coastal areas, where I think where Josh actually deployed more, they got 24 inches, I believe, mm -hmm. of rain. So, As I recall, Columbia is pretty far inland from mm -hmm. the coast. Mm -hmm. yes, so it, the flooding really, really resulted much farther in. Yeah, and the one, the one thing about it, the specialized training that our employees have, a lot of people see these rescues happening, you know, on TV or they see these rescue crews uh, and doing things and they think, well, how hard can it be to go up in a boat and, and rescue somebody from their house? But it actually is a very specialized okay. technical uh, area of, of rescue expertise because underneath that water, it may look calm on top, but underneath it, you get a lot of currents flowing. When you have dams breaching, you get a lot of current and flow that's just all of a sudden created because you got additional water coming in. And unlike some of the other scenarios that you would see, like the flooding that happened in uh, New Orleans and then in the southeast, um, due to Hurricane Katrina, 
they were actually getting rained on a lot when they mm -hmm. were down there. For the first two, or two days that they were down there, it was continuously raining, and so it was, the flooding was getting worse and worse mm -hmm. as they were there. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very proud of them, I'm very proud of them for remaining safe in that dangerous situation oh, and sure. for the rescues that they accomplished. Josh, tell us about your experience. Uh, Captain Walls came home and, and you yes. and your group came in. For... We met up with him in Columbia at okay. the uh, South Carolina State Police Academy mm -hmm. is where they put us up the first night. And I think we, we finally met up with him about 6.30 or 7 o'clock that night. We went over all the equipment, made sure everything was still working. And we had been told in the briefing that we were going to be sent to Georgetown, uh, South Carolina, which was about how many miles, I don't know. It was probably a three-hour trip from Columbia. Because uh, due to the flooding in Columbia, it was receding. Everything on the coastal area, was the water was coming to the coast, okay. and everything was coming up. So we left about 3 o'clock that morning. Uh, Friday morning to go to uh, Georgetown, Columbia. And when we got there, we went to uh, Station 10 there in, in uh, Charleston, I'm sorry. Not Charleston. Georgetown. Georgetown. Georgetown, all right. And uh, met up with the uh, district chief down there, and he gave us our assignments. And we were actually stationed at an elementary school, Browns Ferry Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there with, I think there were three National Guard units there with their big five-ton trucks that they had been mm -hmm. taking people in and out all day long. And uh, for, right when we first arrived, we had a mission. Uh, a lady, she was diabetic, had left her insulin in her house. Oh, boy. Uh, so we, we went to her home, got her medicine for her, anything else that she told us that she wanted. We get, we, I think we got pictures and <laughs> stuff that, you know, stuff that she didn't think she could live without. So we, we went and got it for her. And then uh, National Guard's bringing people in by truckloads, of course. And so we helped the National Guard getting people off these trucks. Some people are, uh, bedridden, they have any way to get off the truck, so we and we stayed busy helping them a lot. Uh, Are they being housed there at the school? They were putting them up. Red Cross was were giving vouchers for hotel rooms. Oh, okay. uh, they had community centers. They were putting people in, just anywhere they could put people. How about any other personal experiences you had? Other, you're talking about the lady that left for medicine. Uh, I'm it sure was, you had uh, some tremendous experiences with some of the individuals. Yes, sir. Uh, the people were just as friendly as they could be. Uh, uh, they were so grateful that we were there to help them, that we had come from Tennessee to help them. They, they just could not believe it. Uh, people would offer us food. I mean, we, we ate like kings because people <laughs> would bring us food. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it was an amazing experience to be able to go down and help. How many people did you probably have any direct contact with in rescuing and housing and loading and unloading? You know, rescue-wise, the first thing, as far as actually putting them in a boat and bringing them out, we probably did 23 or 4, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Contact-wise was hundreds because we went door-to-door -door and, you know, just did welfare checks and damage assessments for uh, the whole, uh, well, not us alone. There were some other departments there, but we covered all of the city and county there around Columbia, just making sure that everyone was, was uh, okay. And other departments from other parts of the country were in there as well, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there were two federal urban search and rescue teams out of Virginia. Uh, a third deployed from California. I'm not sure. Uh, they were on the coast, I think. Yeah, we had July. L.A. County. Uh, several swift water teams from the surrounding area in, in uh, South Carolina. And then uh, there were 84. I believe personnel from Tennessee is what okay. it, it came up to. So other departments from Tennessee yes, as sir. well. Then. Yes, sir. Tell us more about the special operations training that you go through to be prepared to do work like this. Don't go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, uh, our stations here is Station 7 and Station 9, which is located on Cason Lane. This Station 7 is on Thompson Lane. Mm -hmm. We've been uh, given the task of uh, special operations. We're special operations firefighters. Really what that entails is we do all the normal firefighting medical activity that all the stations do, but anything kind of out of ordinary comes to us, which is anything related to rope rescue, the swift water, flood water rescues, uh, confined space rescue, um, hazardous materials, which is a, a big one, that probably one we use the most in the city that we're actually deployed on. Um, Trench and collapse. And structural collapse. Um, which really came about after the Easter tornadoes a few years back. That's when we really started putting a lot of emphasis into our, our structural collapse training. And um, probably the, the two that we would 
you know, use our three actually we, that we really are deployed the most on would be the swift waters. We've had several swift water calls over the years. Uh, we had five in five days at one time at uh -huh. Manson Pike out here. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, structural collapse, we have a lot of potential for it, and the hazmat. We have a lot of hazardous materials in this city, and, and then unless you're involved with uh, emergency services or in the industry, you, you really don't realize that. So. And everyone is trained as an EMT, is that correct? Or? A lot of our personnel is trained as EMTs for the medical response. We, we've got several that are, and we're, we're gearing up more personnel to be trained as EMTs, mm -hmm. and we have several paramedics in, in the department as well. How long does the, the training take you for special operations, or is that just a continual ongoing uh, exercise? It's a continuous mm -hmm. process. It's probably to get initially into into it's probably about two years of training. Yeah. Okay. Just to get through all the schools, it's, it's a couple of year process to get through it. So. And do some of this take place at the fire academy over in, in Bedford County? Some of the classes do, and then some of the some of the classes, the technical classes, uh, we have to send personnel off either out of state mm -hmm. or otherwise to attend some of the training on the technical aspects of that. Um, even our, just, just the regular firefighters, EMTs, paramedics have hundreds of hours of training. I would say that our special operations folks between hazardous materials and a lot of the technical components have thousands and thousands of hours mm -hmm. of training uh, around those technical expertise. And like I said, those situations get very dangerous uh, in a hurry and you really have to have that technical expertise and know what you're doing uh, when you're getting into those situations. I was wondering as far as the water training and, and the rescue, uh, the preparation of that, how do, you, how do you get something set, what you can train in other when, when you have flooding? How do you train with the boats and just in normal streams, is that right? Yes, sir, the, the majority of what we do around here, uh, is in this area, we do a lot of, of flood water rescue. We still have some low lying areas mm -hmm. in, in the city and we've, we've been called to assist in the county also. The county has a, a, a really good team also. And we assist each other, you know, if they, if they need ex additional help or we need additional help, we always have a mutual aid agreement with the chief spoke about earlier. I mean, so we assist each other a lot there. Uh, do a lot of flood. All our training is basically done on the rivers here yeah, okay. in Murfreesboro. Our initial training, we go to East Tennessee we, and they train on the Hawassi and the Alcoe. Okay. That's where the initial training comes from. Uh, we're kind of limited around here. Our, our our high water time of year is this time of year. Yeah. So we do a lot of our, our swift water and flood water training is done through the winter just because that's when our water table is up sure. enough to do it. So. And I can see how Okoy would be ideal with the white water rapids down there. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. sir. And use quite a bit. That's um, one thing in the, uh, that and I, we didn't really realize this when we went on this trip, but the team I was telling us that, that Tennessee is really known for its swift water teams. I mean, that the surrounding states are, I mean, we're known kind of as, as the swift water state. A lot of the, mm -hmm. a lot of the teams deploy out of Tennessee. Have we brought uh, teams in from other states to help us locally or in the general area in the past, in recent past? I don't think in the recent yeah. past that we've had to bring in from other states. Now, when the, when the flooding occurred in the area in Nashville and Ashland mm -hmm. City and a lot of the surrounding areas of that. 2010 there, that was, I believe, yes. There were a lot of teams brought in from East Tennessee and West Tennessee, other areas uh, to assist Nashville in those in those flooding uh, endeavors. There was teams, I know from, from Knoxville, Chattanooga, uh, Kingsport, Tri-Cities area, there were teams from all over um, there that were brought here as well as other areas of the state that were brought in to assist. Same type of rescue type situations that they encountered in Columbia here in, here in Nashville. Did anybody from here go to the flooding in Nashville back in five years ago, I guess it was? Yes, sir, we had a, we had a team deploy in about the second or third day in, went in and helped. Uh, I don't think myself or you didn't. I don't no. think either one of us went. How would you compare that situation to the one in South Carolina? The, I think South Carolina was more widespread. Okay. Uh, just because of the area, the lower lying area, sure. where the and and the Nashville floods, it was a lot of it was just around the Cumberland and the tributaries. So they had. Um, a lot of their, their flooding was more urban, more downtown. You know, yes. It got way up in the like second and fourth avenue and all that. So, yeah, right. I recall uh, that. But it, I think it probably people wise it, it affected more, I would think, in South Carolina because it was just so so widespread. Chief, who's in charge of your training? You more or less as chief, I presume, but do you have some 
Yeah, we particular personnel. Well, we actually have uh, almost two separate divisions for training, and then some of the uh, technical aspects. We have some personnel that are, are capable of helping out with that too. But Assistant Chief Alan Swader is our training. Mm -hmm. our, um, he's over our training division. Assistant Chief Kim Lawson is over our medical division, and they kind of oversee the training in each one of those disciplines. We have training officers on each shift um, that help administer the training to their shifts, as well as a medical training coordinator and a fire training coordinator. Any particular amusing incident you had? It's a very serious assignment. I know, I'm sure you had some that you, you might be able to share with us on our, on our uh, program. Well, they had they had one on their way back from Georgetown, and I don't think that was very amusing. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't amusing to them, but they had a they actually had a, a vehicle crash that happened oh. basically that came right into them. Oh my uh, goodness! And the vehicle actually came to rest against a rescue truck yes. from uh, another who, department. We was able to know our our rescue truck, oh. and this was a vehicle accident that happened. Somebody pulled out oh, in see. front of someone, and that that vehicle came directly into their path. Um, Matt Welcome was driving the rescue truck and he was able to get stopped and the vehicle actually came to rest up against our rescue truck. Um, we had people trapped in, that, in those vehicles. Of course, we had all of our gear and I had all of our personnel there. They had eight personnel and plus the gear were there. So they actually extricated um, the persons that were trapped from the vehicles, you know, right there in the incident that they were almost involved in. So we had an exercise really as you were yes, traveling there almost. <laughs> Chief, uh, uh, Captain, you were smiling a minute ago when I asked the uh, question. You know, I just think about human I mean, relations. I guess you can, one thing about a firefighter can find humor in about anything we do. You know, that's one sure. of the ways Absolutely. we we keep our sanity, I think, from Absolutely. some of the things that we see. But now we didn't actually participate in this, but on, on or in a way we did. But on day two, we were sent out to rescue some kayakers who had tried to kayak in to check on their farm animals. They had lost, oh, they were okay. worried about their horses and their uh, animals they had. And we were able to get to them and, and got them in the boat and got them out safely. But they were worried, one of the animals they was worried about is they had a miniature donkey. They said he's like three foot tall and they, they, they just knew that he was, he was gone, you know, that he had drowned. And they made their way back there and uh, they said that they saw their horses and they got close. And said so they were looking for him, and they looked over and said all he could see was just a nose and two eyes sticking out of the water. <laughs> and he had lived it for two days. He had been standing with and his survived. nose and his eyes. Yeah. And uh, they got to him and got him up on a little hill and uh, got him. He said he was still in about knee-deep water, but I asked if he'd be all right. And they said that they're just, they're like any donkey. He said they're just the toughest animals yeah. you, yeah. that you'll ever come about. But we thought that was pretty amusing. I that, can imagine. You know, yeah. that, that they actually, they were able to get to him and find him, you know, but he, for two days he had survived out there with those horses and pretty. And we mentioned pets earlier, but I presume a lot of farm animals were involved in the flooding. Oh yes, there's a lot there. of, a lot of the, uh, I think most of their cattle they, they lost. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a sheep, they lost all their sheep. Uh, their horses they were, they were worried about because horses just don't do well in flood water. They, mm -hmm. they lose body temperature oh, okay. real quick. But I think they, uh, they managed to get them to a higher ground. They were still in a little bit of water, but I've you know, got them out. And so, uh, you know, you, you don't really think about that aspect of it, but that, that whole area down there around the river and the tributaries are just, just devastated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it'd be hard to explain the destruction that you see from, from what moving water can do in flood water, just this sure. flood and everything. But. Well, Chief, folks, I know you're proud of your, your men and your members of the department. Uh, in, in this re respect as well as overall service. Oh yeah, very much so. <laughs> I'm proud of the job that our men and women do every single day. Um, the folks in South Carolina actually reached out to us by phone, by email, by Facebook, um, in appreciation of our members coming over there to assist them. They gave them a lot of appreciation, as Josh mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, food and, and literally just everywhere that they would go, they would stop, get stopped and say, you know, thank you for coming over here and helping us. And, there were actually people that had lived in Murfreesboro before and moved to Columbia that encountered our, our firefighters mm -hmm. and saw the Murfreesboro patch and, and saw mm -hmm. our apparatus and realized they had come all the way there from Murfreesboro to assist. But I, I am very proud of them. You know, some people have asked, well, why would we send our firefighters all the way to Murfreesboro, or I mean, all the way from Murfreesboro to Columbia? And, you know, the answer to that is nobody is, no locality is too big to need help at times. Um, we witnessed that when we had the, the tornadoes here in Murfreesboro. Nashville witnessed that with the flooding that they had. 
uh, you know, we need to go assist our neighbors, you know, in, in the stead that we may need their assistance sure. coming in the Works future. Ways, and, and firefighters mm -hmm. by nature, you know, we're here to, to make sure that we serve and protect our citizens and make sure that we protect and save their lives. And it's our nature to do that. And whether it's here or whether it's having the opportunity to go do that in South Carolina, we want to do that for sure. Let's see, this was what month when, when this took place? This was uh, October. Yeah, October. it was in October, October. Yes, October. of 2015. Mm -hmm. We're talking here in November of 2015. And Mark, you came on board in August of 2015, is that right? Yes, sir. So you've been here now uh, a little over three months. What's your assessment of the department that you inherited? Well, as I've said to everybody that will listen to me, we've got a great group of men and women in this department. And, and the city and the mayor and council, um, city manager, have very much so supported this department over the years with great equipment. Uh, but people are what make the difference, and our, and our people are top-notch. Uh, I found that out very early on when I came here. I got around to the stations in the first two weeks. We've got some excellent personnel. They really care about this community. They care about serving the citizens of this community, and they do a fantastic job. And it, it makes my job easy um, because they, they are that good. I'm sure that's true. Remind us again the, the size of your department. Uh, we've got a total of 189 staff um, out of nine stations. Uh, of course, we have a 10th station built. We're going to be looking at potentially staffing that. We're going to be providing some numbers to council and let them make a decision uh, on where that's at uh, or making a decision with them on where that's at coming up uh, soon. But we, uh, we're very proud of those personnel running out of those stations. We've got neighborhoods. We're very um, interested and very excited about the future coming up for our and, department. And the budget of your department is... Um, I think it's in the $16 million range. $16 million yes. range. Equipment such as the truck we're sitting in front of comes very expensive, I'm sure. Oh, it very much so does. What will, what will this truck cost you approximately? Between eight hundred and a million, eight hundred thousand and a million dollars to replace this truck. And this is this called a ladder truck? Is that correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's a ladder. It's a ladder engine combination. Actually, it's called a lot of times they're called Quinn apparatus, but it functions as both. Um, this particular apparatus does. And I remember years ago, the fireman would hang on to the rear with the <laughs> handles there to be able to hold on to mm -hmm. the drives. But now that all the, the firefighters that go on a call, they are uh, in, within the truck, isn't that correct? Yeah, they're in the truck, seat belted in, just like we should be. A lot safer. We've, we've learned a lot about safety over the years, I'm, I'm and that's sure what our have. biggest interest is, sure is keeping you. our firefighters safe. What's your next big need? Well, the next big need is, is really just our, our, the public safety training facility is kind of okay. the next thing that's really coming about that's going to help us out tremendously, uh, getting that constructed and getting that underway. And that will be built here in Murfreesboro? Yeah, it'll be here, here in Murfreesboro. <clears throat> well, excellent. Gentlemen, we thank you very much for coming and tell us about your experience. I'm sure you'd be glad to go back again to help our neighbors in, in the east or yes, sir. west yes, sir. or south or wherever. Yes, sir. Great experience, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Captain Clay Walls and our driver, Josh Oliver, and the Chief Mark Folks of the Murfreesboro Fire and Rescue Department, thank you for sharing your experience in South Carolina flooding for the residents of our community. Sir, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.